Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, I have a little bit of a cold, so <laughs> please forgive my voice. My name is Jennifer Cubetta. I'm the director of Uber, and it is my very, very great pleasure to welcome you to the 29th annual Undergraduate Biology Research Program Conference. Yay! So, first and foremost, I hope you enjoy the refreshments over in the um, cafe. Um, I do want to thank the support that we received to be able to provide the lovely snacks. So, thank you to the Student Faculty Interaction Grant. Um, also to the associated students at the University of Arizona, and also the Bio Industry Organization of Southern Arizona, Biosa. They all provided support to give us all the lovely fuel that we need to get through the day. So thanks to them. Um, I'd also like to extend a special welcome to some guests that we have here today. So um, some are here now, some are coming later during the poster session, and students, I hope you keep your ears and eyes open for them. Uh, if they come and visit your poster. So, um, first and foremost, if you're here, please stand and we'll applaud at the end. Um, Provost Andrew Conry, I know you're here somewhere. <laughs> um, Vice Provost Gail Bird. We also have um, Senior Vice President for Research, Kimberly Espy. Uh, Bio5 Director, Jennifer Barton. And we also have some Uber board members with us today. So I know Dr. John Seebeck is here. Um, Dr. John Enemar. Yes, is here. I know Terry Suzuki is here. Hi, Terry. Um, Dr. Ray Woosley, who I saw earlier, should be here. Um, and if there are any other board members who are here that I haven't run into this morning, hi, Dr. Ellis, Nathan Ellis is here as well. So, thank you. And many of you UBERP students have also written your elected representatives to come and visit. Some of them are planning to be here, some are here today. So. Representative Vince Leach is here from Oro Valley. He's over here in the And I know um, Representative Rosanna Gabadon is also coming a little bit later. So thank you for all of you for coming today and for your support. Um, we have a very, very jam-packed day, which is wonderful. So we have lined up coming up um, our keynote address, which is traditionally given by a Uber alum. This year we have Dr. Mohab Ibrahim, um, who's going to be giving a talk today. Um, after that, we have some insights from a few of our current students, as well as one of our board members. Um, we're going to have some recognition of some very special people, and of course we're going to have our student poster sessions. So, without further ado, we're going to get going. I'd like to invite up Dr. Phil Malin, who's going to come introduce our keynote speaker. So, Dr. Malin, you can come up. Thank you. Twenty years ago, Mohab Ibrahim, he looked much younger then and so did I, he came to my office and asked if he could work in my lab as a UBER student. Since he was the only student who came and asked, he seemed like a pretty good student. I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> Why don't you do it? It turned out, I'll get to this later, it turned out that after I accepted him, the next week about 40 students applied. <laughs> but actually the fact that I took him is one of the best decisions that I made ever in my life. We worked on some great projects together. We were very productive socially. The lab had a good time. And this has resulted in what I know is going to be a lifelong friendship. So to set up his talk a little bit, I wanted to tell you uh, about some of his achievements. So he, uh, as I said, was a student at the U of A, worked in my lab. Um, he, uh, after, that, after that, he stayed, got a PhD. Uh, in pharmacology. Following that, he went to, and let me say that, that by the end of his PhD in science, we talk about how many times papers are cited or referenced as, a, as an indication of how important they are. Hmm. By, the time, by the time he finished as a graduate student, his papers had more citations than those of a number of um, university professors in the country. So he was very successful. After that, uh, he went to medical school at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. Um, he, uh, following that, he decided to go into anesthesiology. He did his anesthesiology residency at Brigham Women's Hospital, who, if you don't know the medical world, is one of the major Harvard teaching hospitals in Boston, very prestigious. Um, did a, a fellowship in pain management after that, so post-specialty training. Um, and he did that at Massachusetts General Hospital, 
in Boston, another one of the major Harvard teaching hospitals. He went into private practice for a year or two, and following that, he made a good decision to come back to the University of Arizona and join the faculty in the Department of Anesthesiology. When he joined the faculty, he came here as director of the Chronic Pain Management Program and as director of the Fellowship in Chronic Pain Management. And I can tell you that he's made tremendous progress in both those things. The, the pain clinic is very highly regarded, patients get great care, and the pain fellowship is very, very highly regarded, and the trainees get very good education. Since he's been back, despite, in addition to doing everything else, he's continued to do research. Um, he's published some very nice papers. One of them has gotten a lot of press. It basically says patients with chronic pain, if they spend time around a green light, feel better. So anyhow, um, and it's true, it's what I've asked, you know, I, uh, anyhow, um, I would just like to turn the microphone over to, to Mohab. He's been extraordinarily successful. And I, well, I did want to say one, one other thing. So I, I, I asked myself, why do I think Mohab has been so successful? He's very smart, but there are a lot of very smart people in the academic world. He's a very hard worker. There are a lot of very hard workers in the academic world. But I think two things really stand out. One, he loves what he does. And then enthusiasm brings a little extra spark to everything he does, and I think makes him put in that much more effort, and it really pays off. The other thing is, as you'll, as you'll see, he's very personable. People like him. Everybody wants to help him. He wants to help everybody else, and I think that really pays off, too, because research, science, everything professionally is a team sport. You help other people, and they help you, and that's how you're successful. Anyhow, let me turn the microphone over. Thank you very much. migraines, 
bad pain, and knee and hip pain. This is just in the United States. This is the annual cost to manage these three problems. 14 billion for headaches, 200 billion dollars annually for back pain, and close to 190 billion dollars for knee and hip pain. This is on annual basis and just in the United States. These are staggering numbers. But how do they measure next to the three next leading conditions or heart, uh, medical conditions? Heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. You see, pain costs around <coughs> over $600 billion a year. So if you take any of the two next leading causes for health problems, you will see that pain still exceed them. Not only that, but because of the advances that we have in medicine, people are living longer and longer despite their medical ailments. That means it's projected pain will actually overcome the three next leading medical problems combined. That gives you an idea of uh, the significance of the problem. So how do we treat pain in the pain? Or I shouldn't say treat, how do we actually manage pain? There are usually three components to manage, uh, to manage pain. There's the non-pharmacological, like yoga, physical therapy, acupuncture, chiropractors, meditation, tai chi, basically things that are not necessarily prescribed. And then there is uh, the pharmaceuticals, or the pharmacological components. And these are, I don't want you to look at the slide, just know that there are a lot, and this is just a partial group of the medications we use. There are many, several uh, classes and subclasses of medications that we use for pain. But as you can see, each class or each family come with its own side effects. I'll talk about opioids in just a second in the next slide. So some might say, so someone got blurry vision, but at least their pain is controlled. Uh, someone's a little agitated, but at least their pain is controlled. Someone's a little anxious. It's not the end of the world. However, if you speak with the people that are actually on these medications and see what they describe or what they tell you, how these side effects affect their lives to the point where they do not want to be on these medications, they much rather deal with the pain. For example, I have a young man, he's a pilot, he, fly, uh, he flies fighter jets here in Tucson. Now just by show of hands, who would like a pilot flying a, a fighter jet over their houses when he or she is fatigued, has memory impairments, has blurred vision, uh, cannot really communicate because they have dry mouth and they have problems speaking, and on top of that, they are anxious and agitated. <laughs> I don't want them over my house, personally. <laughs> what if that person is a police officer? Do you want a police officer to be always anxious and agitated with blurry vision, doesn't know where they are? Or firefighter, uh, paramedics, or anyone? So we have to be very careful when we prescribe these medications because we are not just looking at the medical component of it, I'm also addressing the side effects. And I have to decide, of course, in discussion with the patients, is it appropriate to put a 90-year-old person on a medication that can make them dizzy or drowsy, and they already have an um, unsteady gait? If they fall down, that might be their end. So I have to think about these things. All uh, physicians have to think, or at least should think, about the consequences of medications they prescribe. OK, now, opioids. You cannot skip this topic. Turn on the radio, turn on the TV, you look up news, uh, streams, anywhere you turn, there's something about opioids. Who think opioids are bad? Raise your hand. Okay, about ten. Who thinks opioids are bad? Okay, who's really not sure? Okay, good, good. No, that's fantastic. I told you that's good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who thinks electricity is bad? Thinks electricity is good? Okay, I invite you to lick your finger and stick with one of those knobs. <laughs> and it will be a wonderful show. Well, I'm just kidding, please don't. Uh, well, opioids and medications are tools, just like anything else. You misuse a tool.
tool, it's going to backfire. You use it appropriately, you're going to get, a, you're going to get the benefits of it, just like, just like electricity. We use it to power all these wonderful things around us, but if you misuse it, it's going to have severe consequences. How does that apply to opioids? So opioids were never intended for chronic pain management. It was intended for acute conditions. Someone fall down, broke, broke his or her leg. Yes, obviously they will need strong medications for a couple of weeks until their leg or their bones heal and they are no longer in pain. Someone goes to surgery, they are operated on, of course they have an incision, which hurts, it really hurts. They need strong medications to control it. However, if someone has knee arthritis, now we're talking about a chronic condition, and as you know, arthritis does not get better with time, in fact, it only gets worse with time. Now, when you put someone on opioids for this problem, well, what's going to happen 10 years down the road? Arthritis is not going away. The body's going to develop tolerance. The patient will become both psychologically and physically dependent, and I don't say addicted, but dependent on it. And some people, yes, will misabuse opioids, and they will get in a problem. Well, how big of a problem is this in the United States? So, if you look at this graph, just look at the purple uh, curve. This is the global opioid consumption. You see, and something happened here, which is a topic for a different talk altogether. But you see how it shows up. This is the whole world. Now, let's see if the United States is any different from the whole world. If you look at it, it's pretty much almost identical, right? No, the answer is no. I promise this is the last time I trick you. What, what I did here, I intentionally made the y-axis very small so you don't see the numbers. What you will realize is that the United States alone, the consumption of opioids is 15 times higher than all the world combined. All the world. So we're not following the world trend, we're actually driving the world trend. What does that translate into? Well, if you look at this map, I'm not sure if it's projecting well here, but this is the, this is the United States from 2003 all the way to 2014, and I think 2015 is coming up soon. But the red dots on the maps are basically the number of death by overdose on legal, uh, appropriately prescribed opioids. So these are not uh, people who overdosed on uh, street drugs. These are actually patients with an appropriate uh, prescription. See what happens to the intensity of red as you go through the years, 2003, 6, 2007, 2010, 2011, 2014. But you notice, the red is getting more intense with time. That means more and more people are dying every day from opioids. And in fact, as morbid as that sounds, by the time I'm done with this talk, somewhere between two to three adult Americans will actually have lost their lives because of opioids. That does not take into account those who obtain it on the street, uh, kids or uh, people under 18 years old. It does not take into account people that were saved by, by the paramedics. It does not take into account the people that were taken to the emergency room and resuscitated. So when you combine all of these numbers, you see how problematic this becomes. <coughs> so because of the problems we have, we have to start thinking scientifically about how to approach them. Um, so in addition to the pharmacology, before I get there, these are some of the procedures we do on the pain clinic. So these involve injections, radiofrequency ablations, uh, intentionally ablating nerves, and uh, interfering with the signals going to the, to the brain through spinal cord stimulators. The problem with these procedures is that as wonderful as they are, and they do provide a lot of help for many people, they come with significant side effects or significant risks. And the risks can be anywhere from minor bleeding, bruising, all the way to paralysis and death. So what well, that means, we need additional tools in our hands to apply it to the right person. Not every medication works for someone, and just because a procedure works for Carol, 
may not work for Phil and vice versa. So we have to tailor medicine to the patient that needs it. To do that, we have to think scientifically about how to approach the problem. This is Dr. Rolf Ziegler. Uh, he was the first person to introduce me to science. Uh, that's before I actually joined Uber. That's his niece who decided to explore her artistic skills on his face. <laughs> <laughs> and that's him, I think, in Sedona, I think, somewhere. Actually, I'm not sure where that is. Um, but he's the one that taught me how to develop a hypothesis that can be tested. So not every question is considered a scientific question because if you cannot test it, then it may not be a good hypothesis. So I can claim that men from Mars are purple. It's my claim, but how am I going to test that? How can you argue with me about that? So it's really not a scientific <coughs> hypothesis. So. Rolf was the first one who got me into Uber. And after that, I joined Dr. Malin's uh, lab, and I was very lucky to do so. And that brings a good point. When you get an opportunity, do not quit. Because 40 people applied that for me. I was just the first in line. So if you see something good, go for it. Now, to move from where we are to the next step, we have to have different perception or different way of thinking. I'm an anesthesiologist. This is how anesthesia used to be induced. <laughs> Obviously, it's not going to go well today. But if you see where we are now, if you are an anesthesiologist in an operating room, sometimes I feel I'm like someone on the enterprise. We have so many monitors, so many equipment around us to feed us information because we need these information. It's very important and crucial, and sometimes we have minutes, sometimes seconds, to act fast to save a patient's life. And the information that are, are we're getting from these monitors, and by the way, this is only partial monitors. This is one side. There is another side that can have equal or greater number of monitors, depending on the case. So, anesthesiology became a very sophisticated branch of medicine. Now, we need to apply the same concept to, med to pain medicine. We may not be here in pain medicine, but we certainly are not here yet. So we need different ways of thinking. This is my uh, graduation from medical school in 2008. That's me here. Uh, this is my mother. And this is my older brother, Well, He tortured me, I think. <laughs> um, but whenever I get a chance, I get back at him. Because I'm the younger brother. It's my genetic obligation to torture him. <laughs> and believe me, I take every opportunity to do so. He occasionally gets headaches. And sometimes I call him, check on him, and he says, yeah, I have a headache. And as the only little brother that I am, I tell him, well, stop bugging me. Go and take a Tylenol, take an ibuprofen, take something. Stop complaining. He said, no, I like to go out in my backyard and I feel better. He lives in San Diego. So his backyard is really pretty. So one time, I actually, this is not his backyard, by the way. That's my backyard. <laughs> so, one day I actually got ahead of myself, and I decided, I wonder if my brother is right. So I went to read Mark, and I sat there for a little bit, and my headache got better. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I went back to my office, and I thought, what could, what could, ha what could have happened in the park that made my headache better? It's, of course, it's calm, quiet environment, no stress, life is slow, you can think about things to enjoy yourself. But I can do that in my home or in my office. And I thought, OK, maybe the trees are releasing some kind of chemicals in the air. Well, I'm not going to take an air sample in a park and start analyzing what's in there, because I honestly don't know how to do that. Then I thought, OK, let's make it really simple. Could it be the color green? Because it's predominant everywhere. And that's where having a great mentor really is important. That if it's you, <laughs> Um, because one of the things I learned in Dr. Malin's lab is don't be afraid of asking what if. Because many great things start when you ask yourself, what if? What if I do this? What if I do that? What if I don't do this? How, how are things going to turn out? So Dr. Malin was extremely supportive and encouraged me to ask that question, what if? Not only that, 
but he took the extra step of supporting my what ifs. There were many occasions where I would go to Dr. Mill, I'd sit down with him and I'd tell him, I have this really crazy idea. And I see the look on his face, like, oh boy, here it comes. <laughs> and I, we will be discussing these ideas. And then Phil would say, okay, well, let's try it. So having a, having a mentor that can support at least some of your crazy ideas, some of your unconventional ideas, and also willing to help you go through it, that's two of the most two important steps that I learned, or two, two of the most important things I learned that with Dr. Mann. So I asked myself, what if we expose some rats to different types of colors and see what happens? So this is my first experiment. In this panel, you see a rat <laughs> in a cage surrounded by green lights. And we did that with several different types of lights. And we wanted to test how much our, uh, how, how do they respond to noxious stimulus? So we put them in, in cages and we uh, apply a source of heat to their palm. And the rats are free moving. If they don't like it, they just walk away. And it's on a timer, so it stops. A normal rat, on the y axis here, we have seconds. It will take them about 20 seconds to move away from that heat source. And that will terminate. Then we apply different types of colors. You see that the green, much to my surprise, they increased by almost 50%. Same thing happened with the blue, but we focused on the green one. And I repeated this experiment at least five times because I could not do the data. But the data was reprodu reproducible all the time. Then what happens after we terminate the light source? How long does that effect last? After we established the effect, which took about five days, actually took about four days, but we exposed them for an additional day, we terminated the light here. And it took them about five additional days to go back to their baseline. Mm -hmm. That means, imagine this, if you're having knee pain, and you take something, take ibuprofen, you take one ibuprofen, and the effect lasts for five days. That's really fantastic. <coughs> That's what we've seen here. So another thing we wanted to do is something, dose response. How do you do a dose response for light? That was a challenge. So we actually focused on the intensity. And what we realized is that the less intense the light, the better the results. And we rationalized that by the fact that intense light can be aversive. If you have strong light shining in your eyes, that's an aversive reaction. So we basically narrowed it down between 100 to 4 blocks, and that's the maximum amount that's needed. Or I'm sorry, the minimum amount that's needed to produce the maximum effect. And one of the things that people on chronic medications will tell you is tolerance, meaning when, you, for example, opioids, if you take opioids for a long period of time, they, they are no longer effective as they used to be, even though the disease conditions may not have progressed. Uh, so that's called tolerance, which means you need more medications to achieve the same amount of effect, whatever that is. We wondered if the same would apply to light. So this is the effect after shining the light for five days. And this is after flood. There is a small decrease, but it's statistically not, not significant. In fact, if this was opioids, we would have seen the complete reversal. Not only would it have gone down the baseline, reds turn into something called hyperalgesic which means opioids that used to treat pain are now causing pain. And that's also a, a, a characteristic that we see in humans. It's called opioid-induced hyperalgesia, one of the so many reasons why we don't like people on chronic opioids. Next thing we wanted to ask is, how is this happening? I'm shining light on rats. So there are two sources that light can enter the body, either through the skin or through the visual system. And this was really the fun part of the experiment. We fashioned contact lenses, and we applied it to the rat size. And these were opaque, so it really didn't <laughs> Light does not go through these contact lenses, but the whole skin or the, the rest of the body is exposed. And we shine green light on them, and we wanted to see the effect. So this is the control, or one of the controls, no lenses. This is clear lenses, so light still goes through. Again, you can still see that green light did its uh, uh, pain-reducing effects. And then 
when we applied the dark lenses, there was absolutely no effect. So he knew at that point that the visual system is heavily involved in this process. Now, it's somewhat inconvenient to have someone basically in a green room all the time. So we thought, OK, what if we're able to select just the wavelength we want and fashion contact lenses that allow for this to happen? So here, these wonderful group of friends got green contact lenses, actually a plastic filter that only allows for a certain wavelength to go through. And it happens to be the 525 nanometer, which is the wavelength we're looking for. And we just put them in a regular, regular room light. After three days, we basically showed or exhibited the signs that we were looking for. And they became resistant to noxious stimulus. So this is really fantastic because you can think of the human implication or the clinical implications for this process. And we wanted to test, now these are naive rats, which basically means they have no uh, medical conditions, except being rats. <laughs> uh, we also wanted to test that with rats that have neuropathic pain. So we got some rats that had nerve injury, and it manifests by being sensitive to noxious stimulus. So for example, when we looked at the source of heat, again, a normal rat would respond around 20 seconds. When they have the nerve injury, it's down to around maybe 15 to 12 seconds. That tells you they are sensitive to noxious stimulus. When we applied the green light to them, uh, not only they came back to baseline, but they actually exceeded that. So they came analgesic. Another test is to apply filaments that apply a certain type of force. It's called von Fried filaments. And you see how much force it takes for the rat to say, OK, I don't like this anymore. I'm out of here. So a normal rat will respond around 15 grams of force. After they have the injury, they respond to about three to four grams. After we apply the green light, you see they're back to baseline. Now, when we wanted to see how long it takes them to go back to baseline after we uh, terminate the light, it took about 10 days. 10 days for the effect of the light to go back. So that's actually remarkable. Now, the next question is, OK. We show that the light has an effect, and it's happening through the eyes. But ha what's happening at the cellular effect? Because unless I show something, people will look at this and say, oh, yeah, that's cute. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that brings a very important point, which is collaboration. So I need someone to foster my ability to say what if. I needed someone to support my what ifs. But I also needed someone to collaborate with me. Because as you know, especially the more you advance in science, the more you know how much you don't know. That's when collaboration becomes very important. This is Dr. Raj Khanna, and his wife is not in the picture, actually. She's also uh, uh, Dr. Mike Khanna. Her lab is right next to his lab. Very interesting interaction. I actually enjoy it. Um, and these are part of his lab members. When we were looking at the mechanisms, uh, Dr. Connor really helped me quite a bit. And in fact, I'm not sure if you can see her here, that's Lindsay. Lindsay, are you wrong? Oh, here she is. She gave me permission to say that she was accepted in several MD-PhD programs. So congratulations, Lindsay. <laughs> and so Roger helped me quite a bit. And here, we were at uh, Sedona for a conference, but we took the extra time to go hiking. And you see in this picture is Dr. Frank Broca. He also provided a great deal of help uh, to advance this project. So what I wanted to know is how this is happening. So I thought, maybe the endogenous encephalin system is playing a role in this. So we injected the material or a medication called uh, naloxone, which uh, it has a property of blocking all the opioid receptors in the system. So when we injected naloxone, it basically reversed the effect of the green light, which means, in a way, somehow the opioid system is involved. Now, someone might ask, well, the opioid system, we're talking about opioids again. 
This is different. This is the endogenous scopes. These are the molecules in your body who are just tapping into it. <coughs> so we now know that the endogenous opiate system is involved. And with further investigation, we saw a threefold increase in the encephalus at the spinal cord level. Then Raj, he's an expert in uh, chorionics. He looked at several proteins at the DRG and the spinal cord level. And we found several proteins that are involved in pain control one way or another. Some proteins were enlarged or were over, over uh, translated, some proteins were under translated. And this serves as a really good database for someone to say, okay, I'm going to see what this protein does. And we can study that further. But there was another mechanism. These are rats infected with HIV. This is a normal, this is a slice of the spinal cord, and we stained it for the astrocyte and the microglia. So the darker they are, it means they are activated, they are angry, they are not happy. And these cells contain pro-inflammatory materials, which means it causes inflammation. Inflammation translates into pain in the spinal cord. So this is the baseline for HIV-infected rats. After exposing them to green light, you can see the difference between the, the left panel, I mean the right panel, and the left panel. So somehow, exposing the visual system to green light actually decreased the activation of these cells that contain the pro-inflammatory material. Now, it's really fantastic that threads are benefiting from this research. Really great. But I'm a clinician, I'm not a veterinarian yet. <laughs> so I want to know, does this actually work on people? So we got the approval from the IRB to conduct a small clinical trial. I got some people with fibromyalgia and migraine from the clinic, and these people were resistant to every treatment. I, I had basically told them I have nothing else to offer, except let's try a clinic. Try it. So their baseline was about 8 out of 10 on a scale from 0 to 10, with their pain baseline, where 0 is no pain and 10 is the absolute worst pain you can imagine. So their average was about 8. So I gave them the green light. And I have a control group here that I did not put that was basically had no effect. So I gave them the green light and I told them, use it every night for about one to two hours for 10 weeks, then come back. And they had five surveys to fill. And when we analyzed the data, we saw that there was close to about 60 to 70% reduction in their pain, doing nothing but what? In addition to that, so the, the pain intensity decreased by about 70%. The frequency, especially for those with migraine, decreased by about 60%. The duration of the migraine episodes decreased by about 60 to 70%. Their ability to fall asleep, this is remarkable, increased by greater than 80%. And to stay asleep improved by 80%. If someone doesn't get asleep for a couple of days, you know how they feel. So you know how important it is to get a good night's sleep. Their ability to work and exercise improved, and interestingly, and I don't know why they reported this, their ability to do chores also improved by 60% or 70%. I'm all about honesty and reporting all the data, but this is the one I would say, I'm not feeling well today, you do the dishes. But it's just me. Um, these uh, two people, this is Carrie and this is Jessica. This is at uh, our lab. Uh, they are true, amazing technicians. Sometimes they call them magicians. Because I'll come up or will come up with some crazy ideas and somehow they are able to apply it to real life. So having the right people working with you also help. I'm sure a lot of you know or at least should know Dr. Vandra. He's the Department of Pharmacology. He was another great supporter for my work. And finally, that's Raj and I, we were at the Society for Neuroscience presenting our poster. Yeah, he's a nerd. Uh, <laughs> so we both decided to wear green shirts because that was really cheesy. And somehow Lindsay found these green glasses. I don't know where he found them, Lindsay. 
But she came running. I remember she she just came running and she handed me these glasses and said, "You guys have to wear these when you are inside." So a lot of people laughed with us. Some laughed at us, but you know the way I see it, if you're not having fun doing what you're doing, then you really should be looking at doing something different. Because if it's fun, then every day is vacation. With that, I'm more than happy to take any questions. If we run out of time, I'm more than happy, more than happy to stay afterwards to take your questions.
So as a token of our appreciation, um, we, have, we have for you what I like to call the Uber Energy Pack. Um, it's, a, it's a coffee mug um, and a flash drive. Everything that you need to keep going in your work. So thank you so much for enlightening us in your work today. I would like to invite up, if I can get back to it, um, two of our students, go. Tiffany and Kai, if you could come on up. Going all the way up to Kai. So you heard a little bit from one of our alumni, and our Uber alumni are doing amazing things, and so are our current students. And so I wanted you all to have a chance, too, to hear from some of our students who are presenting today. Um, we have Tiffany Cho, who's the president of our Uber Ambassadors Group, and Kai Aragaki, who is the secretary of our Uber Ambassadors Group, who um, I'm going to ask them to share some insights about the program with you before we move on to the first session. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Abraham, for your wonderful <laughs> keynote. Um, probably not going to be as data-driven, but um, yes, so my name is Tiffany Cho, and I am the president of the Uber Ambassadors, um, but I am currently a junior, uh, majoring in neuroscience and cognitive science, and I'm in the lab of Dr. Haijin Kai, and you can see the present later. Um, and I just want to start off um, just giving a round of applause to the friends and the family and the support, the mentors, and to all the students who are here presenting. Um, it's, it's thanks to all of you that are here that this, this conference even happens, and um, to all the supporters, uh, we definitely cannot do um, the research and just, just put our foot into research without, without all of your help. Um, and so I actually want to start off with um, a, a parable. Uh, this is a parable that my uh, freshman high school English teacher told me. And it's just something that's um, really resonated with me. And this is go going to be kind of a f reflection of my, my journey through the group as well. And so um, the parable of the pebbles begins with a man who heard of stories of this wonderful land that is full uh, of many riches. And so um, he had to take a journey across uh, three valleys in order to make it there. And along his journey, he saw many wonderful and beautiful sights. He saw um, beautiful, luscious trees and, and grass and banks. And um, along his journey, he came across a man um, laying on a boulder asleep. And as he walked past this man, he woke up and told him, gather what you find before you cross the river. And as he continued on his journey, he remembered what this old man had told him. But all he saw were rocks and pebbles. And so he put a couple in his pocket, and he didn't see anything else along the way. But lo and behold, he came upon a river. And this river was very steep. and he had to ford it by himself. And he almost slipped and he almost fell. But as he clambered onto the bank, he rested and he looked up and he remembered the, the pebbles that were in his pocket that he had gathered. Um, so he took them out and lo and behold, he saw precious gems that had been washed by the river as um, after he, he had crossed it. And so this this journey that this, this man had, had taken to find the city of riches, it was actually not full of riches. And many people had failed to, to gather the, to, to take the advice of the old man. And so my adventure has been like gathering rocks. And um, many people tell us to, to be involved. And, um, and in you burp, uh, this, the pebbles of this journey have been the community and has been the, um, the experimentation that I've been able to take part in. And so the Uber community is a hidden gem behind the dust and grime of school, homework, and, um, and school, homework, and research. The Uber community, when you brush them off and you take them on a hike, they are super brilliant. Um, that 
So many of these students are compassionate and funny. They are some of the most passionate people you will meet. We have some interested in journalism, um, volleyball, video games, photography, and music. They are so thoughtful and insightful and clever that every time you get together, there, there will always be something new you learn. Um, and they, um, the Uber ambassadors are pen pals with students at Mansfield Middle School. They, we hold science cafes, we outreach the community, we have Christmas, um, Christmas events and holiday events. Um, and through Uber, I have made plenty of lifelong friends. And they are people who I cherish. And they are pebbles that I know for sure will be refined as, as I cross the river graduation. And as a researcher, I'm collecting other pebbles that may need a little more refining. And this past summer, I measured the weights of mice for 30 days, every morning at 7 a.m. and 4 p.m. And these mice, um, after, after I measured for 30 days, I put them in behavioral tests. And so one of the behavioral tests was a open field test where you put a mouse in the middle of a box and they wander around. And as I was picking up one mouse, he, he looked at me. <laughs> and, and I was gonna pick I was gonna pick him up, you know, very gently and place him back into his own home cage. But he like stared at me and he like shook his tail. <laughs> like a rattlesnake. And I, I found out that that was a sign of aggression, and that's why he was like screwing around and like looking me straight in the eye. <laughs> and these pebbles had a lot, a lot of um, attitude. <laughs> these pebbles have a lot of attitude, and what I've learned is that um, these pebbles are going to be the hardest, sometimes the hardest to carry, because although they are small, they, they as you gather them, they, they will weigh on you sometimes. And, um, and when, and as that project generated insignificant results, um, sometimes, like, it's hard to carry them those pebbles. But um, on the way, um, and today's, today's um, data that I'm going to present is, has been just a moving on from that project. And so what, what this has taught me is that research is, is going to sometimes feel like pebbles that you are lugging around, but they are going to be something that will be refined after you cross the river. And, and though at the moment, these pebbles in your pocket seem ready and unrefined. They will become precious gems with time. And um, today, we are here to show off some of the gems that some students have already refined. And again, I want to thank everyone who is here today. I want to remind everyone of just the display of gems, not only the research, but also the humans who have contributed to it and those who have helped us along the way. My name is Kai Aragaki. I am a biochemistry and molecular and cellular biology senior here at the University of Arizona. I'd like to tell you a little bit about how Uber has uh, helped shape my research experience, but first, a small anecdote. So, about half my lifetime ago, um, I went with my father to a Take Your Child to Work Day. And I got to go to a meeting, and this meeting uh, had a bunch of very, very brilliant people talking about insanely technical things. And it was so boring. <laughs> <laughs> so they may as well have just been reading like the obscure ingredients on the back of a shampoo bottle because it didn't make any sense. It was basically gibberish. But anyway, uh, that's the end of the anecdote. My research... <laughs> just stay with me on this one. <laughs> My research is about increasing local concentration of kispeptin 10 by using multi-heterovalent approach. <laughs> so if you've never taken a biochemistry course before, or perhaps even if you have, that might sound a little bit like my father's meeting, <laughs> but I can explain it in a more understandable way. So I can explain it like this, using a strong drug to drag a weak drug where it needs to go. So. It's not the most accurate way of describing this, 
But it sets a good foundation that biochemistry major and non-biochemistry major alike can discuss upon. When I first started my research experience, I thought that the most technical explanation of something was the most credible way of describing things. But upon joining Uber, I realized that that's not necessarily the case. We have so many different majors here that although our course load kind of makes it seem like we've taken every class possible, uh, that's usually not the case. So we have to fill in the blanks for one another. It's not just between UBURPers though, it's between UBURP and our community as well. So while I've had to explain various minutia about my research to my PI, I've also had to explain my research to say my grandma. So it's about having a ability to discuss to a wide variety of audiences. And I learned through this that someone who is comfortable in their field isn't necessarily someone who can describe something in the most technical manner possible. It's someone who can describe something to a wide variety of audiences. So it's only through our audience understanding that they can become interested and inspired. I can assure you that my experience is not unique. Uh, it has happened to many, many other Uberbers. They've gone through summer workshops to learn how to speak. They've talked on the radio, actually, KXCI's um, Thesis Thursdays. And um, this poster conference, as well, is an uh, opportunity to be able to hone your communication skills. So, as you circulate around these posters today, I encourage you to ask the Uberbers about their elevator speech. And you will find, and possibly be pleasantly surprised, on how a seemingly difficult topic can become very easily understandable with proper communication. Thank you. I'm going to ask Dr. Sivak to come up and give a few comments as well on the program. Hello, um, I'm John Sivak. I'm a professor in orthopedic surgery and I'm currently the chair of the UBERP Advisory Board. And the responsibility of the board <coughs> is to find creative ways to find uh, funding so that we can support students so they can enter into uh, research labs with our cutting edge researchers here at the university and uh, carry out projects that will help them find a path to their dreams. Um, the Uber program does more than this, however. There are other benefits that most of you are not aware of. And I decided that today I would uh, tell you about three of my students and explain through their experiences why this program is so important and why we should be supporting it. So this is Damon Sackerman. Damon was a Native American student and actually my very first UBERP student when I came to the university. At that time I had no money and Carol Bender who runs the program and is a genius at pulling rabbits out of a hat managed to find funding to pay for um, Damon to be in my lab so that I didn't have to pay him. So he was a student from New Mexico, and um, as many freshmen have, uh, he had the tendency to go out and party on the weekend occasionally. And one, one Monday, he came into my lab with a black eye, so I called Damon into my office, and I <laughs> wanted to find out what was going on. Well, it turned out Damon had gone to a party, had a little bit to drink, and um, because of the upstanding young man he was, he decided he had to uh, defend his uh, had to defend his honor of his tribe when somebody insulted him. So I pointed out to Damon that he was a very smart young man. He didn't disagree. He was a teenager, <laughs> and I told him that if he wanted to be a doctor, which he did, that he needed to stop using his face to stop to uh, stop other people's fists. These less intelligent people were not going to understand him anyway. And I told him that in order to get a good MCAT score, he was going to need to protect his brain. <laughs> so that was the last time that Damon came into my lab with a black eye. Today, uh, Damon is an orthopedic surgeon and a specialist in hip replacement. 
On the top left of this slide is Verma Miera. Verma came to us from a very poor family, and I didn't realize how important the funding she was getting from UPERT was until she fainted in my lab one day. And it turned out that she was saving her money to pay for her books, to cover her tuition costs, and was only eating every second day. We began feeding Verma, my students and I, to make sure this didn't happen again. And Verma had such a good experience in my lab that she actually went into another program that Carol runs and went to Canada to work in a biomedical lab where she studied um, heart tissue, or tissue that was used, uh, rather, to make heart valves. Now, it turned out in the long run that Verma decided medicine wasn't her ultimate goal. And she became a, a field biologist and worked in a university laboratory for many years and recently retired. This is Nick Diggins. Nick was another student that came from a rather poor background. Nick cycled to school every morning because he stayed at home for 45 minutes, and then he cycled back home at the end of the day for 45 minutes while he obtained a degree in mechanical engineering. Nick had some social and financial challenges, but my students and I worked to help him toward his goal. And his goal was to become a trauma surgeon. So the trauma surgeons are the, the uh, physicians who reassemble the pieces when you come in in uh, various pieces after a, a serious traumatic event, a car accident, something along those lines. Through the work that Nick did in my lab, in addition to the research he was working on, he was able to get into a graduate program and then to work for a couple of years uh, designing trauma instruments. Very recently, Trip, uh, Nick got into a medical school in Detroit. So he's now on his way to fulfilling his dream. These are just three stories about the hundreds and hundreds of students, and many of you are out there now, but there have been hundreds and hundreds of you who have a dream, and we are trying to help you fulfill that dream by supporting you so that you don't have to work in a service industry during the year and instead can be in a research lab. So for these reasons, I encourage all of you in the audience to support the program and these students, and I thank you for your attention your past financial support has made a difference in the lives of all of these students. Thank you. Um, we are going to take just, I know we're running a little bit over time, but there's just 10 minutes that we need to take to do some very, very important recognition of some people in this room. So I'd like to invite up Carol to come up and um, acknowledge John Edward. John, could you come up, please? So while he's coming up, let me just tell you a little bit about John Enemark. He uh, came to the University of Arizona in 1968, uh, fresh out of his doctorate at Harvard, uh, took a faculty position here and rose through the ranks. I believe in 1998, he became a regents professor, which is the highest rank on the faculty here. And all the way through this journey at the university, he's been a Hubert mentor. So he started in the early 90s. He had 15 UBERP students among the many students who he supported in his laboratory. And um, in 2006, he became emeritus, and we snapped him up to be the chairperson of our uh, newly created UBERP advisory board. And in that position, he really helped us lay a foundation for getting the program on some solid financial footing. And because of that, um, we want to acknowledge his contributions in so many ways to the Uber program by giving him a rock. So, <laughs> so those of you who know John know that he likes international travel and he loves to bike. And uh, so we went to Summer Hut and they have gift rocks. So we have given John a gift rock uh, for an acknowledgement of the foundation he's helped us lay. So we hope you will buy something with it that will, you will take with you on your travels to remind you of us. So thank you so much. And I have to ask Carol to stay up here. Yes, please. <laughs> 
So um, I also would like to recognize Carol Bender. Um, <clears throat> as many of you know, Carol is, uh, has been the director of Uber for 29 years and is the cornerstone without question of this entire program. Everything you see at this conference, all of the things that you have been through as a student, as an alumnus, is, is thanks to her. And so I, I do apologize for running late, but I had to sneak this in because we've been working together for the past five years and it's very hard to sneak things past Carol. So, <laughs> so we're gonna sneak it in. Um, so for those of you um, who don't, don't know necessarily, Carol is retiring later in this year. Um, we will have an official retirement ceremony, but I figure since this is her last conference in an official capacity, um, that this would be the most fitting place to recognize her. So for those of you who don't know Carol very well, um, I'm gonna give you a quick Carol by the numbers. Um, her, her CV is like the Encyclopedia Britannica. I mean, it's like that. So this is really quick. Um, so Carol came to the U of A in 1988. You can correct me if I miss any of this. Um, and joined Uberp in 1989 and has been the fearless leader of Uberp ever since. Um, she has written over 20 publications on the topic of undergraduate research experiences. She's given over 50 presentations on the topic. She's written a whole lot of grant proposals which have funded many of your positions um, in excess of $18 million. And those grants come from places like the National Science Foundation, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the National Institutes of Health, the Arnold and Mabel Wegman Foundation, the Flynn Foundation, and many more places. Um, it's just amazing the amount of stuff that Carol has done over the years. Um, in 1993, Carol developed Bravo, and in 2015, she developed ProsComat, both are programs which enable students to go abroad and uh, to, to study internationally to do science with um, collaborations with other scientists. And, um, and for her love of international work, um, she's been awarded many different, many different awards. She's spoken literally all over the world, but um, her awards include um, her title of University Distinguished Outreach Professor. Um, she was also named a fellow for the American, uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS. And um, most recently, last year, she was awarded the 2017 Michael A. Kusanovich Biosciences Educator of the Year. So Carol is just, like, wow. <laughs> um, and on a personal level, she is honestly the hardest working person that I know. Any of you that know her know her passion for students, uh, her passion for excellence, and certainly our passion for making a positive difference in this world. And so she has done all of those things. And so um, what I did, and some of you are in cahoots with me on this, is I sent out a message to ask for any notes and letters and pictures and memories of, of Carol, and I really was amazed to see what came back. Um, I ended up compiling a book to give Carol that's over 40 pages long with multiple comments on each page, and um, it, is, it is just full of things. It is full of uh, you burpers who had no idea what to do when they started, and now they're totally on their way, successful in their careers. Uh, and there's stories of you burp siblings, who've gone through the program together. Um, there are stories from mentors who have talked about their labs and how their labs have flourished because of UBURP students and all the things Carol has done. And there's even a, a very cute story of two people who met in UBURP, fell in love, got married, and now they have a kid. <laughs> so all kinds of, I mean, it's lovely. It's, it's so cute, I, I read it. And I am actually highly relieved to know that I am not the only person out there who hopes someday to be able to keep up with Carol on a hike. Um, <laughs> those of you who've hiked with her, you know this. She's quick. Um, so, I mean, all kinds of things, and so we have, we have that to give you. Um, and when I sent the message out, uh, this is sort of the icing on the cake, one of our alumni, Dr. David Bellows, is a winemaker. Um, he works for Vidden Vineyards in Newburgh, Oregon. He, he sent in some comments, and he said, no, this is, this is not enough. I need to send Carol the fruits of my labor. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so he did. Um, so we have some wine to give you, too, from alumni. Um, but what I thought was so cute was what he wrote on the bottle. So it says, thanks, Carol. Couldn't have made this without you, Burp, and without you. And I think that captures the sentiments of us all. Um, you have done so much here and contributed so much to this program, and we are we're going to miss you. So thank you for everything.
I asked them why. So, <laughs> thank you. So, Dr. Ibrahim and Carol will be here afterwards. I'm sure if you want to say hello and ask questions, they'll be here. Oh, oh, so it's been a wonderful night. Thank you all so much. And I just would like to add that I'm going to have a lot more time now. So, any of you who want to go hiking <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> or get in shape, I'm looking for partners. So, an open invitation. We're going to adjust the time of the poster sessions accordingly, but just very quick logistics. Our odd number posters, we're going to go until 3.15. We'll extend that a little bit further out. I have a, an ear-piercing chime um, that you will hear, and I will go around and clang it in all of the poster rooms. So, so you don't have to watch the clock if you're a poster presenter. When you hear me, then you can switch. Um, the odd number posters are going to go first, um, and then we're going to switch and do the even numbered posters. Um, just so you know, um, there's still refreshments over in the Canning Cafe. We're going to have the infamous carrot cake from the Student Union and some other snacks. Um, but I did want to let you know there's a topical guide to Hubert posters that you should have picked up at the registration table. Um, for those of you who are not as familiar, as Kai said, with, with our technical jargon, if you're not sure what, this, what posters to visit, um, that breaks it down by topic. So if you're interested in you know, cancer or nature and the environment, you can visit those students um, under those headings, and hopefully that will help you out. Okay. So, with that, ta-da! I hope you enjoy the poster session. Um, get ready, set, go, students. Oh, hope you got some stress busting before now. Uh, but please come back at 4.30. We'll see you for awards. Thank you.